Hello, hello, Governor Schwarzenegger. Welcome to Longer Tables. Well, thank you and uh, welcome you to also to Stammtisch. And uh, I think this is the fun thing about it here, is that you have started this whole thing about Longer Tables, uh, this podcast, and we have the Arnold Stammtisch, uh, which is a YouTuber series uh, that deals with environmental issues and all this. You deals with, uh, you know, food and and environmental issues, also climate action and, and stuff like that. And uh, it was interesting because you people reached out to me uh, to go and to be on your podcast. And it was almost simultaneously when our people, when I asked my people to reach out to you, to have you on my show on Stammtisch. So here we are, both of us together. Yeah, this is the Stammtisch, exactly. You don't have yeah. to have it in a shot. You can take it out of the shot. Uh, because uh, uh, we are well, established, but, mine. But I want to say one thing. I cannot believe you. We'll hold it up in you the back. send you send this to me all yes. the way to Spain. Exactly. And, and, and you send me you send me bonbons. Yes. Amazing. From Vienna, you send me these Napolitans. I guess very typical in Austria. Yes, yes. Manna Schnitten. Uh, okay, can you pronounce again? Manna Schnitten. Yeah. Uh, which means uh, wafers, you know, it's like it's like an Austrian kind of a thing. But uh, I, I, I want you, you and your whole team enjoying this and a good Gersa beer, which is a good Austrian beer. But I also want to say thank you very much for sending me uh, your wine, Spanish wine. I love that. Hold on, even though it's, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to have for the first time before coffee, and before breakfast, I'm going to have a little bit of wine. <laughs> cheers, yeah, we, my friend. Cheers. Cheers. For a, a sandwich and longer tables together. Mm. Good beer. Oh, Good yeah. Good wine. Man, you, 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 you Spanish people know exactly how to make wine, I tell you. Well, let me tell you, I think uh, Austrian mm. people know how to make uh, beer and, and, and other things, uh, I, I, I will say. So le let's go directly to... I'm going to start, if you don't mind, Governor. No, to, go ahead. I, I'm going to start with the questions. Because for me, uh, obviously, who, who doesn't know Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor Schwarzenegger? And, and you've been so many things. I mean, it, it looks when we, we read your Wikipedia, it, it's like, it looks like you had 10 lives. It, it, I, I will say you, like you had 50 lives. You've done so many things. So... So yes, you were a bodybuilder very early on. I read that you play soccer uh, even in your early years, that your father wanted you to play a lot of sports. And I love this about you because I'm not very good at any sport, but I love to play all of them. Uh, and, and I think this is amazing. But you've been a movie star, uh, obviously a, a great politician. Um, uh, but what I want to know is when you were a little kid growing up in Austria. I would love for you to tell us things that I don't think people really know. What do you remember eating growing up? Tell me, tell me things you remember that they were amazing, that you love uh, about what, what you ate in your family, what you ate in going out in the restaurants. What do you remember of your childhood? Things like this, I guess, that bring so many amazing memories to understand who we are? Well, Jose, it's a good question. And I would say that there is, you know, obviously a change. Uh, first, when I grew up, the thing that I remember most was that we did not have, uh, you know, much money. And so therefore, there was not enough money really to buy meats every day. So it was mostly plant-based food. You know, I would have in the morning polenta. My mother would make, you know, goulash, which is potato uh, goulash. And she would make, uh, you know, soups with vegetables and all that stuff. And she would have her own garden. And we would, she would go out in the garden in front of the house and she would pull out the carrots and uh, take the, the tomatoes and the potatoes out of the ground and all of this kind of stuff. So it was always very, very fresh uh, foods. And uh, she would just take it out of the ground, wash it, and, prosper, and, and, and cut it up and cook it and stuff like that. So that's what I remember. Everything was really delicious. It was good. It was really healthy. And, um, and then uh, it changed. 
because when I started getting into bodybuilding, I started, you know, eating more foods that uh, had to do with protein. So we ate in the beginning because the only thing we had was skin milk powder. And so I started mixing skin milk powder with milk and with eggs and stuff like that to get some extra protein. And then when I went into the military with the age of 18, I started eating meat every day. And so it was the first time I really felt like as a bodybuilder and as a weightlifter that I got enough protein into my body. So it changed. But I, my, my whole diet, what I remember in the beginning was, to answer your question, was plant-based foods and all natural foods. And I remember my father and my brother and I going out after it rained running out into the forest and, uh, and, and, and finding mushrooms. And then we would bring the mushrooms home and then my mother would just, you know, wash the mushrooms and then she would fry them or she would just cook them and use them for mushroom soup and stuff like that. So it was always kind of fresh stuff like that. So I love that you have all these memories, especially things like going out for mushrooms. Uh, Governor, uh, I, my father will take me for mushrooms. I don't remember going to restaurants when I was young because money didn't allow my working father and mother family to go to restaurants. So we will eat at home all the time very much. And we will go to the market very much every day for bread or uh, every other day for vegetables or for fruits. So I, I love that. So obviously if somebody knows about the influence of a diet, uh, to be who you are, a bodybuilder, uh, changing over the years. Really, you, you move <coughs> through eating a lot of meat and then you, you become uh, uh, mostly a vegetarian diet uh, these days. We saw President Clinton going also from seeing him eating a lot of burgers to move into a really vegetarian diet. Myself, every day, more and more. It's not like I eat vegetables because they are good for me. I eat vegetables because I think they are delicious. Uh, so I will, I think we will all love to know what is uh, Governor Schwarzenegger diet every day, every week, uh, or when you go on vacation, what do you really like to eat? And even one more question, do you know how to cook and you like to cook? Well, you just asked three questions. Uh, let me f answer the first one first. Um, you're absolutely correct, and I think that you have done obviously a lot of reading and research. Um, when you say they used to eat a lot of meats, and then now I'm more uh, plant-based food. And uh, you know, when you're in bodybuilding and in weightlifting, I mean, we were told uh, that the best way to really bulk up and to gain the muscle size was by just eating, you know, 200, 250 grams of protein. As a matter of fact, as each, for each pound of body weight, you, get, you have to have one gram of protein. So I weighed 250 pounds. When I came over with America, so I ate 250 grams of protein. Well, the only way you get that is by having, you know, in the morning already steak and eggs, and then put in your protein drink, you know, three, four eggs, <clears throat> raw eggs, and then have a steak for lunch, and then have a hamburger patty in the afternoon, and this is the way it went. And so it was really good, and it was perfect, because we burned thousands of calories in the gym, working out every day, five hours a day, and lifting like 50 tons of weights a day. So that was, was, was all fine when you're young. And you know, the body is <clears throat> you know, very forgiving, and, uh, but when you then get older, all of a sudden, you know, you hear from the time you're like 50 years old, the doctor will say, well, you know, I see some signs of, of deterioration in your arteries getting clogged up. It's not anymore as clean as it was like 10 years ago when we look at the pictures. Uh, so I would just watch a little bit what you eat, Arnold, and uh, just be sure not to eat as, many, as much meat anymore. And so each time, each year when you go for your physical, the doctor starts stressing it more and more, stay away from the meat. And then at the same time, I then became in my 50s, I became governor of the state of California. And then now I started getting into the environmental issues. And one of the things that became very clear was that producing livestock and producing all this meat, you know, creates a lot of pollution. And uh, so I realized that we can cut down on meat intake and uh, we would then protect our environment better. And at the same time, we are protecting our body and our health. And so that's what I did. So now I'm not vegan, 
But I would say when people ask me, I said I'm 70% vegan because I definitely have cut down my meat intake by 70% in any case. So which means that I every so often have a steak and do a barbecue. I, when I go to Austria, I have Wiener Schnitzel. But throughout the rest of the time, I would say I just in the morning I have oatmeal and then I go and when I have lunch, I have a salad and I have kind of much more plant-based kind of foods. And every so often I would have some, you know, a, a salmon or something like that. But it would be much, much leaner and much healthier foods that I'm eating today than I ate in my bodybuilding days. So do you go to the kitchen often to cook or you let this work for somebody I, else? In most, I would say most cases I eat uh, out when I have breakfast, I eat in a restaurant after. What I do in the morning is I always, after I feed my animals, I go and take a bike ride down to Gold's Gym and I work out there and then I take a bike ride back and then I have uh, breakfast at a, at a restaurant or at a hotel where I usually always go for breakfast. And, um, and then lunch I usually don't eat and then I have dinner and I have something very light. I, as a matter of fact, at dinner a lot of times I have just cucumber salad and a vegetable soup. So first I have a vegetable soup and then a cucumber salad, but there are really no hard or heavy foods at all. And so this way I cut down my calorie intake and also my, my carbs and everything like this. Uh, because as you know, when you get older, I mean, you're not at my age yet, but I mean, when you get to my age, uh, your metabolism slows down and so that everything you eat just makes you heavier. So you have to be just very careful about that. But the, the bottom line is, I think that uh, definitely I have stayed away from meats much more because of environmental reasons also, like I said, because 28% or so of our pollution of our greenhouse gases is created by creating livestock and, and, and you know, feeding those animals and doing all the agriculture work and all this stuff. So I think if we all kind of cut a few days out of our meat intake, I think we can help the environment. This is just for people as a reminder, because so many times people always ask, what can I do? to improve the environment. I'm a nobody, I have no money, I'm not, I don't have any power and all this stuff. And I always tell people, everyone can do something. I say, here's something you can do. You can start cutting down on your meat intake and just have much more, you know, kind of plant-based food. Thank you for sharing these insights about Arnold Schwarzenegger, the, the, the foodie. Uh, but one, one moment that for me was very important uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, you made a video that went viral when you were calling on Vladimir Putin to end the war in Ukraine and even you called for the Russian people to resist their government because this uh, unjust war. Uh, but what was very amazing and moved me and moved a lot of people is that you did it with a lot of elegance. You were not trying to lecture anybody you were making so much sense on the beautiful message you you were sending you you are a very effective uh, communicator uh, governor and it's very important to be a communicator in this moment that seems the world is very polarized that or you are with me or you are against me you you you've been a person that very successfully has brought people together to the table from different political spectrum, different parts of the thinking process. What, what does it take to be like you, to bring people together, to build longer tables? Well, first of all, as you know, I always, as I said in the video, I loved the, and always loved the Russian people. You know, they're very hardworking people and all that. And I have also the utmost respect, you know, for the leadership. They chose the leadership. That's the, the way it is. And I respect all of that. I just wanted to, you know, kind of share my point of view about the war, you know. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, the key thing is when you do those kind of talks that you don't villainize anybody, you know, that you don't kind of degrade them or call them names or anything like that, because this is counterproductive. And it doesn't matter if it's about the Russian uh, war against the Ukraine or if it is the insurrection on January 6th or if it is the prejudice and the kind of hatred that we see around the world growing and growing. 
against uh, you know Jewish people or uh, you know black people or black people against white people and men against women, women against men, and uh, you know it's it, everyone hates everybody. It's just it's, it's, it's just it's it's terrible. And so what I want to do is talk and address those kind of issues. Uh, but I think that you know um, I was always politically kind of in the center. And I never really villainized, you know, kind of the Democrats nor the, the Republicans when I thought that they were off the rail uh, or anything like this. Um, and I think maybe it has something to do with growing up in Austria, because Austria has been from the beginning, from the time, you know, I was born there, it has become a neutral country. And so it's kind of like Switzerland. We don't kind of align ourselves with anybody. And I think that the very fact of doing that and just kind of like having it be one of those major cities that has the UN there, where people come together and have discussions and meet, because the more there's dialogue, the more we can solve problems. I think that's what it is all about. And I think this is what is so appealing about the your longer table, uh, uh, you know, a podcast and about the, your, your whole idea uh, of, uh, you know, bringing people to the table and talking rather than fighting. And here's the food, here's a little bit of wine, and let's just schmooze a little bit here, and let's get along and let's kind of uh, celebrate and move forward and make this world a better place. So this, this is kind of what my intentions are with this whole thing, and, uh, and uh, I just think it's important for us to make every effort, and that's why I have this newsletter um, and have my own uh, you know, podcast and, and app and all of this stuff, and to bring some positive uh, to this, uh, you know, kind of environment that is so much negative today. And I think that you're doing the same thing. I mean, it, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, that's why I, I love uh, your career and I love your, your mind uh, because, and we get into that later on, but I mean, it's just so great when someone is, has such a refreshing outlook and says, I'm here to make my successful restaurants. I want to be the most successful chef. I want to, to you know, make money and all of this stuff and, and be award-winning uh, you know, chef. But at the same time, I want to feed the world. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable to go out there and to, to, to feed that many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people around the world, wherever there's a trouble area, and so that, that's fantastic. And I think this is, this is what is important, is to, for us to bring people together, for us to be positive, for us to be contributing uh, to our community, to our state, to our country, and to the world. And I think this is something, one of many things that we have in common. So before I pass the questions to you, I, I have one more question. I will say a piece of If you don't mind, I want to have another sip of my Spanish wine. Yeah, and I'm going to have another sip of uh, my Austrian uh, beer. Mm. 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 I, cannot, I cannot believe I didn't send you Iberico ham. Uh, you sent no. me a good bottle of yeah. Spanish wine. I, I, I need to send you, like I I need to send you breakfast. I need to send you more things. So the piece of advice I need from you is, you, you were co-chair of the President's Council on Sports, Fitness and Nutrition uh, under George H. W. Uh, w. Uh, Bush. And in that role was amazing. You visit, you took it really very personal. You own that role and you visit 50 states. Can, can you share uh, any memories you have of that role? Because President Biden has invite me to be the co-chair now and any guidance, any feedback, sharing with me, with us, a good memory. And what do you remember of playing that role that in many ways can be very important to try to move every American, especially children, to do more about the sports, to do more fitness and to eat in the right way. Right. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations. It's one more thing that we have in common. You're the chairman of the President's Council. It was then called on physical fitness and sports. I know they added some about diet now into the whole uh, title of it. Every president kind of expands on the whole thing. Uh, it started out just being the council for sports when, when, um, when Eisenhower did it. 
And then uh, when he started it yep. in 56 or so, and then it became under Kennedy, the sports and fitness thing. And then he had all the athletes in front of the White House, uh, you know, always exercising and doing sports in order to show to the world how important sports is and how important and how he thought it is an important, important element to the development of kids, to do the mental and the physical development. And, uh, and so every president since then has led the holding, some were more active, some were less active. And there were a lot of chairmen of the President's Council on Fitness. Some of them were more active and some of them were less active. I wanted to go in there when uh, President Bush Sr. Uh, asked me during the, uh, when he became president in 1988, and I remember exactly it was at the, at the Kennedy Center where we had the big <clears throat> premiere, presidential premiere uh, for twins. He came to me afterwards and he said, uh, do you want to be the chairman of the President's Council on Fitness? Because I want you to pump up you know, the, 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 the fitness thing in the schools because there's just so many you know, uh, physical education teachers that are being laid off and kids are not getting quite the fitness anymore in the schools and blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, it would be a great honor to do that. And uh, so he was very serious about it and he loved that I was reaching out already at that point you know, the Special Olympians and exercised with them and created the whole powerlifting movement among Special Olympians. He loved that I was doing seminars and speeches all over the country to include everybody and to not just talk about bodybuilding, but of, about fitness. And then when I became the chairman, finally, I remember it was after my movie Total Recall, I went to the White House and he, uh, you know, appointed me. Um, you know, I took it very seriously. I felt honored that he had the trust in me. And I told him I'm going to put a plan together. And I put the plan together and that the plan was to go to all 50 states in the United States and to have fitness summits <clears throat> in each one of the states with the governors of that, any, any particular state, with the health officials, with the educational leaders, uh, with the environmental uh, uh, leaders, with the uh, uh, you know, people that are fitness leaders and... Um, so I brought everyone together in those summits and in all 50 states, think about that. I was traveling around, this was during the time when I was still heavily doing movies also. I was doing two movies a year. It was at the time when I was doing Terminator 2 and I was, you know, uh, doing a Total Recall and all of those kind of things and uh, True Lies and whatever else. But I mean, I found the time to travel around and to promote fitness and to make sure we put the spotlight on the issue and uh, let people know that it is extremely important to keep our physical fitness programs in the schools three times a week and have the presidential medal being awarded to kids that actually can do a certain amount of chin-ups and sit-ups and uh, you know, rope pulls and whatever else and running and all this kind of thing. So that's what I did. And I was a, it was a very, very successful mission. President Bush was very, very happy. And I also introduced uh, the president to the idea of having a fitness event once a year on the South Lawn of the White House, just like Kennedy did. And we made it much bigger even. And on May 1st, we had every year, uh, you know, the fitness, we declared it a day of fitness, and we had... You know, endless amount of, I mean, every sport you can think of was on the South Lawn of the White House, including uh, you know, rope climbing, the military was there, the, the Marines, and, 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 and it was just fantastic. And there was senior citizens there, there was golfing there, and putting, and the tennis, and the football players were there, lifting weights, life cycles, rowing machines. And then the president and the first lady, Barbara Bush, <clears throat> we all went around from station to station, after he did his speech at seven o'clock in the morning to the nation about fitness and about diet and foods and all that stuff, he then, um, you know, went around with me from station to station to station very patiently and promoted and put the spotlight on all those activities. So it was really fantastic. So, you know, there's so many things you can do. You just have to look at this whole thing, get together with experts and say, how do we promote health and fitness in this country? And you maybe have a whole other idea, uh, but I think you have the big benefit that you have to, uh, in addition to your 
loving exercise and all this, but the food element, as we all know, is so important when it comes to health and fitness. So the more we can teach our kids that are into cheeseburgers and hamburgers and all this greasy food and all this stuff that they, you know, can eventually, you know, kill us, uh, you know, to just give them an education about food and how important it is to take care of our body and all this stuff. So there's a lot of things that you can do. I think the most important thing is to use your work ethic that you have had throughout your whole life and to use that same kind of a, a work ethic when it comes to being chairman of the President's Council on Fitness. You know, and to really come up with a program, present it to the President, and then talk him into having the fitness events back again at the White House and all those kind of things. So you're going to do, do, do great. And if you need any help with any of that stuff, I sit down with you. I'm calling you. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing because I asked you for advice. And uh, Governor, you gave me the entire program. Uh, so the good news, I agree with you. We should do something like this in the White House. Obviously, keeping the sports, my, my co-chair, it's uh, Elena Deladone. Uh, De La Don is the WNBA uh, player uh, of the Mystics, and, and I, I love that, that I'm, I'm next to an amazing basketball player that she's going to be bringing the fitness. I'm doing my part, but yes, we're going to be bringing to that lawn of the White House, all of America, and we're going to be keeping that very simple message that people like you already began so long ago. The good fitness with good nutrition is what is going to keep America better healthier and looking forward for a better future. I have no doubt. So I think it's time we move with uh, your question. Well, yeah, because, because you're, uh, there was you're a busy good. man. You're a busy man. You, 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 have, you have asked me some interesting questions. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you some questions. Um, first of all, I just want to say right off the top um, that those people that don't know that are watching the Stammtisch, uh, you know, Jose is one of the most famous and extraordinary chefs in the world. And uh, not only because he is an extraordinary chef, and not only because he started as a kid already with this business of, of learning how to be a chef and uh, opened up restaurants in, in Spain that were very successful, then moved to America uh, with the age of 21, the same age I was when I moved uh, to, uh, to America and then moved to New York first and then to, to Washington and started with his partners. A whole bunch of restaurants, successful restaurants. So I think it's important for you guys to know that, that the followers of the Stammtisch that maybe doesn't know so much about us say, he's just an extraordinary successful restaurateur and is, you know, is in the food and the culinary business, has his whole life, he's very passionate about it. He's been an award-winning chef and not only an award-winning chef, but also got the presidential medal from uh, President Obama in 2015 for all of his extraordinary work. And this is important now to, for you to understand, all of you, that he has not just been so great with his, you know, restaurant business and all this, but he said, it's not just about me, it's about we. And this, he had this idea of creating the world's central kitchen. Now, those who, of you that don't know about that, there's an ex extraordinary idea that whenever there is a problem anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter if it is an earthquake somewhere or if it is the fires like in California, if you had all those fires and all of a sudden he set up the world central kitchen in California. Within days he was here and organized. And I was even up there, I remember serving breakfast uh, to our firefighters and all that stuff. But so he's just an unbelievable giving. He gives back to the community and to his country and to the world and all this stuff. And this is what made him really famous now because everyone is just so in awe. How can he do all of this? So I just want to ask him my first question right off the top. A, do you know how many things we have in common, Jose? That we both are immigrants? That we both moved to America with the age of 21? That we both uh, became successful here in America. We both uh, already have been successful before we got here and were passionate. We both are into giving back. We both are the chairs of the President's Council on Physical Fitness. 
We both are in that environment, and I can go on for the next hour about the things that we have in common. And we both are good-looking dudes, Mi let's be honest mili here. Military service. Uh, I did military, military service. service. Exactly. Yeah. You did military service. That's what I'm service. saying. I could go on for hours and hours. So my question is just, you know, what made you fall in love with the culinary business in the first place when you were a kid? And you said, okay, my life will be about cooking food for people. I want to be a chef. How did you get into that? Uh, my mom and my dad were both nurses. Um, my mom will be the one cooking more during the week. Um, and my father more on the weekends for more friends. My father and love, love to cook and feeding people. My mom had more the love to feeding the family and making sure that my three brothers and I we will be fed. For me growing up was every morning we'll be walking uh, on the bike, going to the bakery to buy the bread that just came hot out of the oven. Uh, if I didn't behave, a way for my mother to punish me will be not giving the opportunity to go in the morning to pick up the hot bread. I will eat the bread halfway to my home because it was so good when it was hot and so, and so crispy. So I, I just watch my mom feeding us, my father feeding us and friends, and they always put so much love, especially my mom with leftovers. You know, uh, Governor, I don't remember any dish on the beginning of the month when there was uh, money because my father and mother just got the paycheck and you will see that they will buy and fill up the fridge. But I remember when the fridge was empty at the end of the month, my mother will be able to do amazing things out of nothing. If she had some leftover breadcrumbs, uh, bread, she will make breadcrumbs with it mm -hmm. and she will then get whatever was the leftover boiled egg or ham, and she will make a bechamel. Uh, everybody knows bechamel, flour and milk, and you will make this kind of thick uh, cream. She will put whatever leftovers were in the fridge. And then next day she will make balls and roll them on egg wash and the breadcrumbs, and then she will fry them. This is what in Spain we call croquetas. I learned that almost Every country has like a version of, of something roll on breadcrumbs. I, I love those croquetas. My brothers love those croquetas. So if you tell me the spirit of my mom and my dad being nurses, that always you got this mentality, we saw it during the pandemic, that they always give back even beyond their duty. Uh, to me, they were, I always knew that nurses and doctors were always heroes because we don't realize the amazing work uh, they do. And unfortunately, we had to have a pandemic to realize how important they are in, in our society. But then also to see the love that my mom will put feeding my brothers and I, and the love that my father will put cooking big pots of rice, of paella, for anybody in the hospital. My father always say that if there is, that big problems have very simple solutions. Uh, if more people show up, he will say, just add more rice to the pan and problem uh, will be solved. Uh, so I think for me, cooking was something I saw as something like brought people together that, that made families better. Not perfect, but better because cooking together, kind of you become a stronger in very, very, very difficult. Everybody has their way to, to explain it, but but you setting up the table, sitting. Um, that's a matter how good or bad the dish was. Use the effort that, and the love that was put into the cooking is what right. is some right. of the best memories I have. Yeah, but I mean, what's interesting about it is, is it's really fascinating, you know, to see that your mother was a nurse and your father was a nurse and they all worked together in the hospital and all this stuff. And that's what got you into food and into cooking and becoming a chef, but there's millions and millions of chefs out there, 
but only a very few that are having the business mind and the willpower and the vision all of a sudden to go and say, I'm going to use this talent and I'm going to create a business and I'm going to be self-employed and I'm going to go and take that risk and take investors in and to be partners and all of this and start opening. It's a really risky thing to do to go into a business yourself, right? Rather than working for someone and having no headaches and just going to work. So what, what made that bridge? What built that bridge that all of a sudden you say, I'm going to go into America and I'm going to go and open up restaurants and I'm going to be a famous restaurateur and a successful one? Well, uh, for me, America was something I always saw through the movies. Uh, in, in a way, you are responsible. Through, through movies that I wanted to be part of America, where everything seemed possible. When I came, I, I came to America first, uh, before I was 21, uh, on the Spanish Navy. I came sailing in a ship, and I saw the amazing American flag and, and what the symbols. I remember right. being next to Ellis Island and, and Lady Liberty, and I'm like, I want to I wanna be part of America. So when I finished my military service, uh, I got the opportunity to come to New York to be a, sh a cook in a restaurant. And, and I came to learn and I came to be experiencing uh, everything that America seems was offering, which was the freedom if you were hard to become whatever you wanted. And when I arrived Washington DC, uh, I came, I was 23, this is 1993, I moved from New York, uh, that I arrived like a young boy where everything was learning. New York for me was like the perfect melting pot. Was not only the perfect melting pot, but the perfect university for a cook that wants to learn about cooking. In New York, I could learn about every single restaurant cooking of any country and region from anywhere around the world. I became a better cook because being in Manhattan. But when I arrived in DC, I was uh, offered this job by amazing people that they always made sure that my success was their success. And I just began doing what I know how to do. I say I don't, right. I don't open business, I don't open restaurants. I am a storyteller. How do I tell stories? The only way I know, I tell stories through the dishes that made me who I am. Behind every dish is a story. Behind every dish is people that made that dish happen. Without realizing I was a cook, but without realizing I also realized that I could be a storytelling, a storyteller telling people where I came from through the dishes I was putting on the menu. Yeah, but I mean, Jose, uh, it's fantastic, but I mean, what is the amazing thing is not only did you uh, become a great chef and then you became a great restaurateur and uh, led these restaurants that everyone just has, has thousands and thousands of fans that are coming back and coming back and eating there and, and, and all that. But I mean, at what point did you get this idea? Well, I want to do even more work. As if you were not already working hard enough, working 15 hours a day with those restaurants. But you say, I want to add to this work and I want to create the world central kitchen. How did that happen? That you decided that there's so many people out there that need food. There's war zones where they need food. There's fires, there's earthquakes, there's problems, there's floods, and there's this and that, there's this misery around the world. I gotta go and feed those people. I mean, how did that come about? I mean, what was your drive to give something back? At the same time I arrived uh, uh, Washington DC governor, I began volunteering in an organization called DC Central Kitchen. DC Central Kitchen was amazing because it was fighting food waste, which we know has a lot to do with global warming, bringing that food that was untouched. And actually it happened on uh, Ronald Reagan inauguration day, the day it was founded. 35 plus years ago. But take a look what happened here. The guy that founded this, Robert Egger, was a bartender. And he saw that food waste was not really the only problem. The problem is that we were wasting people's lives. So he brought the food that was untouched and really ready to throw garbage. And he brought the people to a kitchen, began training the people to become cooks. 
those cooks will make sure that the food waste was no food waste, but food opportunity and making meals to feed the homeless population of Washington, D.C. I became a volunteer. I became the chairman of the organization. I learned so much watching how a plate of food could be really an agent of change, not throwing money at the problem, but investing into the solutions. You as a governor know, knows this very well. We were fighting food waste, giving opportunity to people, training them, feeding the homeless, and in the process, finding jobs to those men and women that once they graduated after the training, will join the ranks of different restaurants around DC. Brilliant. But at the same time, I was watching what happened in Katrina. At the same time, I was watching in the distance how we left men and women sometimes, like in the Superdome, four days without food and water. The system was overwhelmed because sometimes government cannot do it all. Everybody forgets that government is only as good as its citizens. And FEMA, who is the organization in charge of providing response and bringing different NGOs to make it happen in certain events could be overwhelmed. That's when actually didn't began really in the States, but when Haiti happened, the big, hurra, the big earthquake in 2010, I said, you know, this is mayor. I am a cook. And when you have an emergency, you send nurses and doctors to take care of the wounded. You send the firefighters to take care of the fires. But when you have to feed people in an emergency, who do you think is the most prepared people? Those are cooks of the world. So I went to Haiti and it's when World Central Kitchen was created. Without realizing over the last 14 years, we've been in so many places, in the fires in California, in Ventura, and so other places, in the volcano in Hawaii and in the volcano in Guatemala. We've been in the war in Ukraine. We've been uh, in the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. We've been in, the, in Bahamas after Dorian. At the end, it's a very simple thing what we do, Governor. Uh, in the way we see it, every restaurant, every chef, every cook, every volunteer, every person that drives a car and can deliver, uh, every, every helicopter pilot, uh, everybody belongs to World Central Kitchen. What happened? They don't know it yet. We go to a place and we are able to feed people quickly and fast because we use local resources, we use the local assets, and more important, we allow the locals to join us because nobody knows better than the locals. At the end, we the people, we become one. We are able to reach one million meals a day in matter of days in a very organized, sometimes illogical way, but in a way that we don't come with a plan, we adapt. Adaptation is, I would say, the trademark of World Central Kitchen. If you have a plan, you will fail because every emergency is different. But if you adapt to every emergency, you can always respond. That's a matter of what happens. Well, I, 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 I think that you're giving government a little bit too much of a break here because I think it was a disastrous performance on the government's part when it comes to some of those emergencies. And uh, to me, I don't think it's an excuse to say that the, the government gets overwhelmed. But you didn't get overwhelmed. You didn't get over. You were there. But, you fed uh, the people, and you were organizing, and you were helping. They were frozen for weeks. They were frozen until they did something about it. And I think that happens to a lot of places where there's emergencies. And I think that the important thing is is to just really be willing to go in there. Of course, as you said, for you and for government, for everyone, it's the same thing. Every emergency is different. You don't know when you go to Ukraine how you're going to pull everyone together. You don't know when you go to Haiti. Uh, you know, how to pull everyone together and to know all the chefs and bring them together. You did not know when you came to California how to pull all of this together and what do the firefighters really need and what time do they eat and all of those kind of things. But you did it. You adapted very quickly to the situation. You did it, but the government has sometimes has a real difficult time in doing that. And so I think just the world of the things that you're doing, and my question is just, you know, of at what point did you find out that the environment is something that benefits here with all of this when you say talk about food waste because you're absolutely right i mean for 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 decades and decades 
restaurants threw food away. And they never even saw the synergy that we could actually use this food and feed those that need food. There's so many hungry people that every city has. that are the homeless people that are out there that, that, that need to have food and all this. And then eventually someone comes up with this plan to use actually this food that is not to make it a waste, but actually to make it an asset and to feed people. I mean, and then that has an environmental kind of connection because food waste creates a huge amount of greenhouse gases and pollution in the world. And for you to kind of cut that down by using it, how did you come up with that idea? And at what time did all of a sudden the environment become important to you? Well, uh, um, Governor, people like you uh, that very early on you put the environment front and center in public domain. Uh, we saw Vice President Gore doing the same. Uh, people like you are people that they, they've helped create in people like me this mentality that obviously the environment is very important. Uh, but one of the things I've been saying lately for a few years now is that I don't believe we are giving food the importance it deserves. I believe that food only sits at the Department of Agriculture, at the USDA. And seems the Department of Agriculture even does amazing things, uh, school lunches and the farm bill, sometimes is there at the service of, of the very big companies, which by the way, I wanna have a very big company. I have no problems with very big companies, but I don't want big companies taking advantage of subsidies when the small farmers can't. I don't want the big restaurant chains take advantage of those subsidies in the way smaller restaurants can. And you're gonna tell me, Jose, what this has to do with the environment? Everything has to do with the environment because I am realizing that one of the biggest factors we have and one of the areas that becomes a problem is food. Food is the reason why we have hunger or the lack of it, lack of distribution. Food is the reason why we have health issues, obesity, and all the other sickness that happens because overeating. Uh, food is the one that in many ways is putting a lot of CO2 in the process of feeding uh, um, humanity. In the way we produce foods is one of the reasons why we are contaminating our waterways and our oceans because we are contaminating our oceans, food is also scarce because without uh, oxygen, like in the Gulf of Mexico, all of the sudden you see only but dead fish in the beaches all across uh, the world. At the end, food is everything. Food is defense, food is energy, food is immigration reform. Cannot be that the people that feed America and the people that feed the world sometimes cannot feed themselves. Cannot be that we have 11 million undocumented working in farms in America, but we are not able to give them once and for all the right to belong, not ghost of the system, but people that with work permits or green cards or whatever it is that Democrats and Republicans agree, we will give them finally the decency to belong to America. So at the end, what I was trying to say is that food is so important that I, uh, I've been calling for a long time to presidents around the world that we need to have national security food advisors next to every governor, next to every president, because there are a lot of problems that we create in the way we manage food, when actually food can be an amazing opportunity to solve problems from the CO2 emissions, to hunger, to, uh, to obesity, to et cetera, et cetera. Food is the solution. Food must stop being the problem. And the environment will be one of the biggest beneficiaries. Used to end. You know what is one of the biggest contributors of CO2 and in the process also makes people poor? The way people feed themselves, the way people cook actually. Almost 3 billion people, 3 billion people cook with charcoal, with fossil fuels. They cook with uh, three rocks on the floor and some wood or some charcoal. In the process of feeding themselves, they're making themselves unhealthy, they're making themselves poorer, 
and they're making, they're cutting down the trees and they're making pollution happening more and more. One of the biggest opportunities we have, and this is what I would love for you in your next conference that you are leading uh, in Austria, talking about environmental issues, is that the, the issue about the kitchens, clean kitchens that will feed the wall will, will be a very important issue that you will talk because I do believe if we provide every family in the world with a clean kitchen like you and I have at home, we can help to have better, better climate. We, we will fight CO2 emissions. We will fight poverty. We will fight hunger. We will fight deforestation. We will fight so many things just by having cleaner technology for cooking and feeding every family around the world. I think this is a brilliant idea and we definitely will bring this up in our discussion at our environmental conference, at our climate conference in Vienna in May. And I tell you one thing that uh, I think it's a good idea what you had about recommending uh, for governments to have their own food advisory person there. But I just want to suggest to you to let the private sector set up those advisors and not government, because otherwise it's a political appointment and they will not be able to go and solve the problems again, just like it was with any of the disasters. So I think the private sector should set that up, but I think it's a brilliant idea. And I also hope that you will be there at our conference one time and talk about all of the issues that you care about. I want to give you an invitation today to come, if it's this year in May uh, 18th, right? Uh, or May 16th, sorry, that this year in May 16th is our conference in Vienna. And uh, because I think it is such an important issue, you know, the environment is something I'm very passionate about, but we have to address the environmental issue, just like you said, from so many different angles. If it is, you know, what kind of cars do we drive? You know, what kind of a power do we generate? Is it from fossil fuels or is it power that is renewable energy from a renewable energy and all of those kind of things? It's the, what, what transportation system should we have? How do we go and eliminate, you know, the pollution that kills 7 million people a year is really the question. And there's indoor pollution, as you have talked about charcoal, about food and all this stuff. It's also there's just millions of people still in some of the th third world countries that have stoves inside their home and they're burning you know, coal and they're burning wood and they're inhaling this exhaust and, and, uh, and the pollution, so they, they die from in, inside pollution, uh, air pollution. So I think there's so many issues we have to talk about. I love your take on the food, so I hope that you can go and join us one time at our World Conference. And I want to say thank you very much for this great, great interview. You've done a great job. Keep up the good work and remember, when one immigrant asks another immigrant for help, we are always there for each other, okay? We are always there for each other. And remember, Governor, what we do, immigrants like you and I, mm -hmm. we build bridges. We build bridges between faraway places. And we show that people, we are more equal to each other and that we should love each other more than you hate each other. That's immigrants right. like you and I, we, we, we are so important. Everybody everybody should be in a way an immigrant that's right absolutely thank you very much i'm proud of you keep up the great work okay and if you need anything let me know i uh, will until Here's next time uh, until Salute. next time longer Salute. tables and stand me tish stand me tish oh. Man, I, I, listen you and i we have an accent huh you and i th that's the other thing we have in common we have an accent yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. Have a good day. Hasta you la too, vista, baby. Bye, <laughs> Hasta la vista. Oh man, exactly, I love it. Yeah. No, he made my day. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs>